Welcome. I am Krista Cowan. I am the corporate genealogist here at Ancestry. So thank you for being here and hello to our friends on Facebook who are watching this along with us. Um, so this session is about finding the maiden names of the women in your family tree. And because we're uh, just a little bit more casual in these demo sessions, there's no PowerPoint deck for you to look at. You just get to stare at my tree and we'll walk through some things. It also means you need to uh, maybe take some notes uh, because you're not going to see anything up on the screen as far as bullet points go that you can take a picture of. So the first thing I just want to remind you, particularly for those of you who are new to family history, is that the best way to not lose ma women's maiden names in the first place is to record them, <laughs> okay? The genealogy standard is that when you enter a woman into your family tree, you always, always, always enter her with her maiden name. So you can see from my tree here, right, every woman has her maiden name in the tree. She doesn't have her maiden name and the other three names of the husbands she married. She doesn't have, you know, her maiden name and something else in parentheses or, no. You just record women with the name they were born with. In ancestry in particular, every time you add a spouse, we take that into consideration. So we add um, that information to the algorithm when we're providing you with hints and when you're doing searches from your tree, okay? So you don't have to add that information. Now I know some of you have lots of excuses for why you do it, and it's your tree, so you can do whatever you want, but do it right, okay. <laughs> I have the microphone, I can say that. <laughs> Okay, so a couple, of, a couple of the challenges that we have. Typically, what we're doing when we're doing family history is we're starting in the present and we're moving backward through time. And so you end up finding these women, for example, on a census record with their married name, right? So we're gonna take a look here at my great-grandmother, Ada Mae O'Brien, and we're gonna hope that the internet keeps up with us. Apparently, we're already off to a rip-roaring start. Sometimes when you open things in a new tab, they load faster. Sometimes not. <laughs> okay, well, while that's loading, let's talk about this. So I have Ada Mae on a census. Uh, she's married and she has a child, okay? And so I know her married name because of that information. So start to think about what are some places where I could find her maiden name. I don't need you to answer out loud unless you really want to, but we're a big group and we're being recorded. <laughs> so, so one of the things that we sometimes forget to do is think about all of the children that a woman had. So that's the number one tip. If you want to write down anything, think about all of the children that a woman had. When I inherited my family history from my dad's side, from one of his aunts, I was doing the data entry. She'd had all these paper files that she'd collected over decades, and I was entering it into my very first DOS-based genealogy software program. I was like 13. I was that kid. Um, and I'm doing this. I'm entering this data. And I remember looking up at my dad one Sunday. He was sitting at his computer next to me, and, he, and I said, Dad, it's really weird. You descend from a lot of one-child families. No, he didn't. It's just that all my aunt had ever cared about was who were the parents and who were the parents and who were the parents. And then she'd hit a brick wall and she couldn't figure out who the parents were and so she'd say, okay, that line's done and she'd make a little X and then she'd move back and go up another line, and, right? Well, part of the reason she kept hitting all those brick walls was because she was only identifying the parents. And it, the more information you have about a family, the more likely you are to get information about the whole family, including things like the woman's maiden name. So tip number one is consider all the children that she had. So this woman right here, she is my great-grandmother. Um, she is the, father of my, or the mother of my grandfather. She died, my grandfather was one of the younger children. She died when my grandfather was just three years old. So he didn't know a lot about her. And then my grandfather died when my mom was 17. And so my mom never knew her grandmother, and she knew very little about her, and she had very little to transmit to us about her, other than the fact that she gave me her middle name, which I love, okay? Um, the, the challenge was, oh, apparently my microphone needs to be adjusted. We love Eddie, he takes good care of me. Okay, so um, my grandfather, uh, my mother when she got involved in family history, sent away to California for his death certificate. Um, and um, the information on the death certificate was not entirely accurate. Cause you know, people. 
and they give information and it's not always entirely accurate. So she started talking to her uncles to get information about their mother, right? So again, you have to consider the whole family. The same thing then happened with her husband and his family. Okay, his death certificate actually didn't even include his parents' maiden names. Mom ordered that and it just said, don't know and don't know. <laughs> At, like, that's not helpful, okay? So again, what she did is she went into records and started to identify who were the siblings and do any of their records have that mother's name on them, okay? So consider all the children. Another thing to do is to pay close attention to who's recorded on the record. So going back to Ada May here, we have this census record from 1920, from 1910, okay? There's this new thing on Ancestry. Ancestry has sources here in the middle and the facts over there on the left-hand side. And for several years now, when you click on a source, it highlights it in purple, and then it shows you which facts in your tree are supported by that source. Well, something brand new that we just did in the last couple of months is this. When you click on our source, it now also tells you which relationships are supported by that source. What? Oh my gosh. So when I click on this 1910 census, it tells me the relationship to her husband and to her oldest child is supported by that source, but so is the relationship to her father. So if I open it up and look at it, if I hadn't paid close attention before, this might be new information to me. What I'm going to discover is that on this census, living in that same household is her father. Okay? So again, one of the things that sometimes I see new people in particular do is they get the hint or they get the record and they never actually click through to view the original image, right? If there is an image attached, Always, always, always view the image. That's tip number two, okay? If there is an image available, always view it. If there's not an image available, right, and in some cases Ancestry is only given the index, we don't have the originals of everything because the archives don't share all of those with us, but if there's an index and no image, order the image, right? Write to the archive or the library or the the um, record center, right? Because they'll send you that original image, sometimes even digitally, and there is oftentimes more information on the original than there is in the index that was provided. My favorite slash least favorite <laughs> example of this is the England and Wales uh, civil registration records, right? In England and Wales, they keep meticulous birth, marriage, and death records. They have since 1837. They created an index to all of those wonderful records, and they provided that index to Ancestry. Here's one of the challenges, okay? The first challenge is this. I'm pretty convinced that in England, there's only six first names. <laughs> Charles, George, John, Anne, Elizabeth, Sarah. That's it, <laughs> right? And there's only a, a few last names, and so what you end up with is you end up with a ton of people with the same name born in the same time in the same place, and unfortunately, the index that they created only provides us with the name of the person, the quarter that the event, birth, marriage, or death was registered, and the registration district. And so I could have 12 options for one person. And so I have to send away and pay the money to get those certificates or those register copies because the register copies are going to list the names of the parents, sometimes the occupation of the father, the residence where they, they're living, right? And so you have that information that's on the record that's not on the original. So where an image exists on Ancestry, always, always, always view it. And if it doesn't exist, if you can order it, order it, because it's going to have more information. And in this case, her maiden name is the bonus because her father is listed, or he's listed there as the father-in-law of the head of household. Okay, so that's tip number one and tip number two. Now, tip number three is a little bit um, more obscure, okay? Um, on Ancestry, one of the things that we have done and let's see if I can find a good example of this. I probably should have had one prepared. Um, one of the things that we have done is we have created what we call internally rotated records. And here's what I mean by that. 
you can have a marriage record, for example, and the marriage record is going to list the bride and the groom, and then it's going to list the parents of the bride and the parents of the groom. So you're going to have six people on one record sometimes. And Ancestry, in a lot of cases, has indexed where we can all six of those names. Well, it used to be, years ago, when you'd search on Ancestry, or when we'd give you hints on Ancestry, we would only give you a hint for the bride or the groom, because we had identified them as the primary people on the record, right? But what we discovered was sometimes people are coming at these families from different angles. So we went ahead and we created what we call rotated records. So there might be a record for the mother of the groom, but when you pull it up, it looks a little confusing. Okay, so here's the example. Actually, this one will work really well. We did this with this obituary index here. Okay, it says it's a hint for Ada May, and it lists her last name as Woodruff. Okay, Ada Mae Woodruff. But this is not a record for her. And the reason I know that is because when I'm looking at this page, there is no date, there is no place, there is no other information other than the fact that uh, she has a sibling named Franklin. Okay? You can click on any name in this record and now do you see how that record changes? Now all of a sudden I've got dates and places and a lot more information. So in this case, Franklin is the primary person on this record and she is just one of the secondary people mentioned in the record. But we're gonna give you a hint for that so that you can check that out and see, is this for my person? Now I'm gonna tell you right now I, that this is not my person. Right? So if I didn't know her maiden name, I might think, oh, we found it, and it's Fisher, because she has a brother named Fisher. But as I investigate this more closely, what it's telling me is this is happening in New Jersey, and there's these other family members, and none of that matches anything else I have. And so I'm going to come back here to that hint, and I'm going to say, no, no, this is not her. And it's going to dump it. It's going to dump that hint into the ignored tab, because I said no. And I can come in here and I can actually give a reason why, okay, the places are wrong and the relationships are wrong. And I can say, I'm pretty sure her name isn't Fisher. Okay, and I can leave that and it sits there. And then what happens is if I come back later and I find out, oh wait, he's not her brother, he's her stepbrother. And that's why his last name is Fisher. Oh, that really was her. I can still pull this record out of that ignored tab and resave it. Okay. So one of the things that we do and you need to pay attention to, and this is kind of your obscure hint number three is we're going to deliver you hints anytime we see a name on a record that we think matches your person, but check to see if you're looking at the primary person on the record or if they're just mentioned in the record. Does that make sense? Okay, I know there's a lot of you standing around and like I said, we're being videoed here, but are there any questions in the space about that specifically? Because that's important to understand the difference between primary records and rotated records. You're all just happy to let me keep talking. Correct. When you say no to a hint, it is not gone forever. And as a matter of fact, if you're not sure whether this record is for your person or not, we would much rather prefer, and you ultimately would be benefited by saying no, instead of saying yes because you think you want to save it just in case, right? Because as soon as you say yes, even if you're not sure, what happens is it adds data to your tree and sometimes relationships to your tree that it then starts looking to prove right. And if that's wrong information, you're going to end up climbing someone else's family tree. <laughs> it has happened to me. With this family, actually. Okay? Okay, so. Uh, let's see. That was one, two, three. Let's talk about hint number four, tip number four here. So when you are doing searches, let's just do a global search here. Oh. Y'all, Max and I are not friends. I just, someday I'm going to learn how to use them, but today is not that day. Okay, when you are doing searches, one of the things that you can do is you can search without names. Okay, it's so funny to me when I, because I sit and watch you all do searches, that sounded way creepier than it really is. Sometimes when I'm at events like this and I'm helping you at a computer, <laughs> um, I'll watch the way that you approach the search form. And it's always amusing to me that we put in the name right first, 
it's at the top of the form, so that makes sense. But sometimes we get stuck in this mental model that the name is the only thing that identifies a person. And so if I just got the right way to spell it or the right variation of it, that I could just find the thing if I just did the right thing with the name. But the reality is, is that the name is only one part of a person's identity. And with women in particular, when you don't know what her maiden name is, what do you search for, right? You can search for her married name all day long, but all that's going to return you is records that have her married name on it. So one of the things that you can do is you can just search without, a, oh, I love when I do that. You can search without a last name. So you can put in every other piece of information that you know about her that identifies her uniquely in the world without a last name. Okay, so think about her first name, her birth date and place. What other things make somebody unique in the world? Who her, yeah, like you might have some clue about a sibling's first name. You might have some clue about a, their children's names. Like think about all the other things, like you might know where she died, you might know when and where she got married, right? So you can search for all of those things without any last name at all. And what you're gonna find is that you'll get sometimes long lists, and there's ways to filter down those lists, but sometimes just try to do searches without putting in a last name, okay? That's tip number four. Any questions so far? Okay, we're gonna keep rolling. We've got a few more minutes here. The next thing is to think about the kinds of records that would contain a woman's maiden name, okay? So if you don't know her maiden name at all, you can't just jump straight into census records where she would be a child, and especially not if it's a common name, right? You're not gonna look for every single Sarah living in New York City in 1880 and hope you just come across something that magically makes sense, right? So you're gonna have to think about what kinds of records contain that information. The easiest record, of course, to look for, for a multitude of reasons, is gonna be her marriage record. So you search for the husband's name, her first name only, and if you have an idea of when and where they were married. Now, why are marriage records the easiest? Well, here in the United States, at least, marriage records are the most consistently kept record. Birth records for most states in the United States weren't kept until on a consistent basis at a state level until after 1900. Death records have been kept sporadically by various places over time, but the government has always wanted to know about your marriage, right? There's always been governments and churches and communities keeping track of who's marrying who for lots of different social reasons, right? And so marriage records not only are the most consistent, um, but sometimes they're the most detailed as well. So Ancestry has one of the largest collections of marriage records. And if you want to see if a marriage record exists, you can just do a search, right? Just search and see what comes up. Or you can use my favorite thing, which is the card catalog. Now, those of you who have seen me talk about the card catalog before uh, know that one of the things I advocate is searching by state or country to kind of narrow down your list. But what if you're not sure where she got married, right? You maybe have an idea, hopefully, if you know like where her oldest child was born, if you have an in, in indication of where she was born, you might be able to narrow it down to a couple of locations. But one of the things you can do in the card catalog that has nothing to do with typing in a specific location is you can narrow it down by record type and then by time period, okay? So I can say, I wanna see just the, oh, I wanna see just the marriage records on Ancestry. And what that's gonna tell me is that there's 1,932 databases, but really I'm mostly interested in the marriage records from, let's say the 1870s, okay, in the United States. And now I'm just looking at 664 databases. And here's one of the reasons why I love the card catalog, y'all. Sometimes I search for things in the card catalog intentionally and then I get a little frustrated because either it doesn't exist or it's not in there like I thought it was. And sometimes I'll just do something like this and see what comes up. And I get to learn really cool things like, there is such a thing as US Evangelical Covenant Church records for Swedish Americans from 1868 to 1970. That's a thing. And if I had searched for a specific state because I thought I knew where she got married, guess what would not have come up? 
that record collection because it covers the entire United States because Ancestry, instead of obtaining it from a state record office, we obtained that from a church organization that collected those records from around the country, okay? And there are several databases like this, okay? Um, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in particular um, has provided us with quite a lot of records. Um, and so you end up, uh, we have a huge, huge collection. As a matter of fact, uh, I think I'm pretty confident in saying the largest collection of Quaker records that date back to the 1600s. Again, those are not state specific or location specific. They're religion specific. And so exploring the card catalog on the basis of location, time period, religion, at a really broad level, you're going to find some gems in here. Now, the question I always get asked whenever I show the card catalog is, well, why don't you just search? Like, it's going to search everything anyway if you just search, right? Well, that's true, but if you're searching for somebody named Sarah, married to somebody named William, who got married in about 1872 in a state you're not quite sure of, how many search results are you going to get? There are 24 billion records now on Ancestry, and you're going to get probably a few hundred thousand results. And so one of the things you have to start thinking about again, and I've said this before, is what makes this family unique in all the world? And religion can be a defining factor. So start to understand what religions they might have associated with and then you can come in here to the card catalog and check and see, is there a specific set of records for that particular faith? Are, how are those records kept? How are they organized? And like I said, marriage records are the most accessible uh, because they've been kept the longest. So in this case, right, I can come in here to this uh, Evangelical Free Church of America, Swedish American church records from 1842 to 1947. That is a very specific set of records. There are 7,854 records in this one database. So again, if you had done a global search, there's, these are going to be in the search results, but you're going to have to wade through to find them. But if you come here to the card catalog, I can come in here and I can just say, you know what, I'm looking for Sarah, and she was married to William. And because it's a very specific set of records, it's going to tell me if the record even exists in this database or not. And now I haven't wasted a bunch of time searching and searching and scrolling through search results. Does that make sense? Right? So when you get to a specific database, one of the things that I love is I just put in two pieces of data. I didn't have to fill out the entire search form. I just said, I need to see if in this set of records there's a Sarah married to a William. And there's not. And so I can come back out here and I can say, well, maybe I needed to be in, where'd they go? I sorted this earlier so that I knew what I was looking for. Oh, it's the second set of records here, I think. Okay. And maybe I can come in here and I'm just going to type in Sarah and see what comes up. Right? There are 73 women named Sarah listed in these records. I can scroll through those kinds of search results, right? So again, what you're thinking about is what makes her unique in all the world? If you don't know her last name, that's fine. Don't search with a last name. Then look in the card catalog and see, are there marriage records in particular that are for the particular faith that she practiced or the church that she would have been married in that fit the time period and the location that you're interested in? Was that number four? That was number five? We got through them all. There you go. And I think we got through them all with like a minute and a half to spare. Are there any last minute questions? Okay. Thank you all very much. And thank you to our friends on Facebook.